Well, let me welcome you into our second week of a summer-long uh, series of studies through the books of First and Second Thessalonians. If you were here last week, you will remember that uh, we began by learning that all through these two small letters that Paul wrote to his friends in this Greek town of Thessalonica, he wrote to them with a recurring theme, a thought that kept resurfacing over and over as he wrote. It's the thread that runs all the way through both of these books. And it is the theme of the certain return of Jesus. Do you remember last week we, we said that Paul kept on coming back to this truth. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. By the way, when Jesus comes, this is what will happen. Hey, Jesus is coming, and so we need to be doing this or that or the other. He continued to come back to this theme of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, these two letters are divided, as you'll recall, into eight chapters. Now, Paul didn't write chapter and verse, but later they were divided into eight chapters. And in each of the eight chapters that make up these two letters, Paul visited this topic of the return of Jesus every single time. In 1 Thessalonians, he talked of the return of Christ in chapter 1, verse 10, in chapter 2, verse 19, in chapter 3, verse 13, in chapter 4, verse 16, in chapter 5, verse 2. Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians. And in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 5. Every chapter in 2 Thessalonians. Over and over again, Paul kept saying, Jesus is coming again. And all summer long, we're studying in these two books to talk about that promise of his return, to talk about the fulfillment of that promise and what that might be like, and then most importantly, to think about how we should be living, what we ought to be doing while we're waiting for him to return. Now, before I go any further today, though, I want to make a point to you to say clearly that Paul is not the lone biblical voice who is affirming the fact that Jesus will one day come to earth again. In fact, here's what you should know uh, without any uh, confusion at all. It is that every single author in the New Testament affirmed that one day Jesus would come again. All four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all affirmed that Jesus said with his own lips that he would return to the earth one day. And all four of those gospel writers agreed and declared that he would in fact come again. Luke, the writer of the gospel of Luke, also wrote another book in the New Testament, the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, Luke affirms there as well that Jesus will come again one day. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is going to come again one day. And all of the writers of the epistles, not just Paul, and Paul wrote about the coming of Jesus not only in First and Second Thessalonians, but also in First and Second Corinthians, and in Romans, and in Colossians, and in Philippians, and in all of his writings, Paul referred to the coming of the Lord. But not just Paul. Peter wrote in his letters about the coming of the Lord. Jude wrote in his tiny letter about the coming of the Lord. James wrote about the coming of the Lord. The book of Revelation, of course, talks about the coming of the Lord. Here's the fact. Every single author in the New Testament says that one day Jesus Christ will come to the earth again. Let me say it plainly. You cannot believe the New Testament and not believe that one day Jesus will return to the earth. It's impossible. Because every book in the Bible or in the New Testament affirms that in fact he will come again. This idea, this doctrine of the return of Jesus Christ is a fundamental, basic tenet of New Testament Christianity. And New Testament Christians must believe that one day he will in fact come. Now I should also say to you that the thought or the doctrine of the return of Jesus is more than just a New Testament doctrine, it's also an Old Testament doctrine. 
Because the Old Testament repeatedly speaks about a coming Messiah. And when we realize that the, New, the Old Testament doesn't mention Jesus by name, but we know that Jesus is in fact the fulfillment of those messianic prophecies, then we can know that the Old Testament speaks about Jesus coming again as well. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah talked about Jesus coming or this Messiah coming And he said that he would rule over a kingdom of perfect harmony and perfect peace. In fact, he calls this coming one in Isaiah the prince of peace. So peaceful will that empire, that kingdom be, that Isaiah says the lion will bed down with the lamb. Imagine that. That's a perfectly peaceful kingdom. He says that it will be so full of peace that the child would be able to play over the serpent's den and have no fear of being struck, that there would be no harm and no hurt in that kingdom whatsoever. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel that when he comes, this Messiah Jesus will rule the world from a temple in Jerusalem. And Zechariah tells us in the Old Testament that he will be the king over the whole earth. Loved ones, I'm making the point to you as emphatically as I can from New Testament and Old Testament of this singular fact, Jesus Christ is coming to the earth again one day, and God's people ought to praise God for that fact that one day he is coming. Amen? He will return. The fact is, if you don't have confidence in his second advent, then you have no basis for believing in his first advent. If you doubt that Christ will return one day in the future, then you must doubt that in fact he came 2,000 years ago. If you're not sure about his certain revelation in the future, then you ought to have real doubts about his resurrection in the past. And if you're not certain that one day he will come and descend from heaven, then you should doubt when the Bible says that he ascended back to heaven. Every one of us need to know the Bible is explicit on this point. One day Jesus is coming again. In fact, would you help me preach? Tell your neighbor right now. Just tell him Jesus is coming. Get ready. Tell him. I think that's an old gospel song. Jesus is coming. Get ready. Well, he is. Now, one of the things that the Apostle Paul does in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he's talking about this this promise of the return of Jesus is that he connects uh, the return of Jesus to the, the hope that we have when a person that we love passes away. When someone dies in the Lord, Paul talks about those, those times when we bury people that we love and he says, but we can have hope when those people die because of this certain reality of the return of Jesus. And this, is, this has been a really important week for us to think about that at Brookstone. You know, we've had three funerals since we were together last Sunday. And, uh, and it's been a week in which we've thought a lot about the fact that there's hope because Jesus is coming. Well, look at this passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, where Paul talks about those who have passed away and the hope in their passing tied to the promise of his coming. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, or unlearned, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, after the dead in Christ have risen, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, that is with those who have died and now been risen, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a very frequent practice of mine at a funeral service when we make our way to the cemetery and the family has gone to that grave as far as they can go with their loved one and we're now going to have to walk away. They're going to have to leave their loved one, their, their, the body of their loved one and bury them. I will often turn to this very passage and speak of the hope that the grave is not the end of the story that Jesus promises us, Paul affirms for us this promised resurrection at the coming of the Lord. Now this passage in 1 Thessalonians is filled not only with hope, but it's also filled with insight as to what the, that event of the coming of the Lord might be like. And so I want to answer this question for you today. Just jot the question down, and then I'm going to give you four answers to the question. But let's begin by asking, what will happen when Jesus returns? If the Bible is so explicit to tell us that he's coming, what will happen when Jesus returns? You know, this morning, the sun came up, and none of us were surprised that it did, right? I mean, we, we didn't get up and go, oh, wow, the sun came up. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that today. And we weren't surprised because uh, it came up yesterday morning, and it came up the morning before that, and it has come up every single morning of our lives. Every single day, the sun rises in the east, and it dutifully sets in the West, in between the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun, we live our average and ordinary lives. And for the most part, our days are routine days. Now, I know we have really good days that are to the extreme with blessing, and we have really bad days that are extremely difficult and, and hard days, but for the most part, we live average and ordinary lives, we have rather mundane and routine days. But here's what I want you to know. One day the sun will rise and that day will be unlike any other day in the history of days. Because on that day, Jesus Christ will come again. Amen? And that will be a day that will change everything. And Paul tells us what that day will be like. Now, I want to show you. In fact, if you have a pen, I want you to circle in verse number 15 what he says when he says, For this we say unto you, listen, by the word of the Lord. What Paul is going to describe to us about the coming of the Lord is direct revelation from Jesus himself to Paul about what that day will be like. Paul is not gleaning information and interpreting from some other passage. He's not telling what he has been told by some of the other apostles or disciples. He says in verse 15, what I am getting ready to tell you is coming to you. I'm delivering it to you by the word of the Lord. The Lord has told me that this is the way that it will happen. And by the way, we know that much of Paul's writing came from direct revelation from the Lord. So he says, this is what will happen on the day when Jesus returns. Write it down. Number one, here's what will happen. Jesus will descend from heaven. That's number one. On the day when Jesus returns, literally, Jesus will descend from heaven. Verse number 16 tells us this. For the Lord himself, he's not sending an angel for us, he himself is coming, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now notice, the Bible says that he is going to descend from heaven to the clouds, to the clouds. You'll see this in verse number 17, where the Bible says that the dead will rise we that are alive and remain will be called up in the air, in the clouds, and we will meet the Lord in the air. So at Jesus' first appearing in his second coming, he is coming to the clouds. And I love the fact that this passage tells us that he is coming with great joy and with great power and in absolute victory. You see this in the description of his descending with a shout. Jesus, the Lord himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, what do you think of when you think of a shout? 
When, when, when someone shouts, maybe you think of just sort of an unintelligible, you know, sort of like at a ball game where the crowd goes wild. It's just as everybody's shouting. That's not what this means. Maybe you grew up in, in church world where they used to shout in church. Sometimes we shout a little bit around here too. Tracy's grandmother was a shouter. She would, she, would, she would get so filled with joy in the Lord that she would stand up in church and just shout. I'll never forget the first church that I pastored. There was a little shouting lady in that church. And on about the second Sunday, I'm on the front row and they were singing and she shouted and I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> Literally jumped out of my seat and I thought the preacher shouldn't be surprised when somebody praises the Lord. That's not what this talks about. That's not what this means. The word shout here means to give a command. It is an, an, an order that is given. It's a military uh, word. It's the idea of giving a command as the general or as the captain or as the leader. So when Christ comes, he will descend from heaven with an order. He will give an order. Now, I don't know exactly what that order would be. I don't know exactly how he will say it, but I would think it will sound something like, come forth uh, to the dead in Christ, come up to those who are living. And if you need an example of what it might be like, you need only turn to the Gospel of John. Don't go now. John chapter number 11, where Jesus spoke to Lazarus, who was in the grave, and he shouted to Lazarus. John 11 says, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave. Well, the Bible says that when Jesus comes, he's descending and he's given orders as he's descending. He goes on to say in verse number 16 that he is coming with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. Now, this is an angelic voice, not the voice of the Lord, but a repeating command. The angels shouting commands as well. And then he says in verse number 16, he is coming with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet blast of God. The trumpet blast that is the assembling of God's people, the calling together of God's people, the trumpet sounding. Now imagine this appearance of Jesus is a rather loud event, amen? I mean, Jesus is shouting, angels are speaking, and the trumpet of God is sounding. Compare that, if you will. Contrast that to his first advent when he came in such quiet humility. When he came to a stable in Bethlehem where the only sounds heard were the lowing of the cattle and the braying of the donkeys and the, and the sheep. And the only sound that he made was the tiny cry of little lungs crying out desperate in need of his mother's care. You hear this pastor this morning, the second time he comes will be nothing like the first time that he came. He came the first time in humility to be our savior. He's coming the second time in power as king of all kings. What will it be like when Jesus comes? Well, first of all, he will descend from heaven. Secondly, the Bible says in verse number 16 that when Jesus comes and descends from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, that the dead in Christ shall rise. Verse 16 at the end of the verse simply says, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, the Bible promises us a future day of resurrection. The Bible is clear that when we die, our spirit departs from our body. But our body is buried. Our body goes back to the dust, but our spirit is with the Lord. But the Bible, speaking of our bodies, says that one day there will be a resurrection of the body. And by the way, not only of the saved but of the unsaved. There is a resurrection of the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. The Bible says the just unto life eternal and the unjust unto everlasting damnation. The Bible promises us that there is a resurrection coming one day for all 
people. But when a Christian dies, our soul goes to be with the Lord. Our body is buried. What the Bible says is that when Jesus comes, those Christian bodies will rise. Now, apparently, the Thessalonians were worried. They must have been worried about their friends, their loved ones who were dying. They had trusted in Jesus. Now they're dying. And they must be thinking perhaps they had apparently written to Paul, had asked to him, what about these loved ones that have died? Has God forgotten them? And he says in verse number 13, no, God hasn't forgotten them. Don't be ignorant about them. They're with the Lord, verse 14. They're going to come with him when he comes again. And they're gonna, their resurrection will go first. They will, verse 16 says, they will rise first. The living will not precede them. So the Bible says that when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ will rise. You may say, well, what in the world? I mean, how could that really be, right? What, is, what does that look like? I mean, you know, you, we, we know that, that when, when our bodies die, they decompose and, and, and perhaps they're cremated or, or after some time, ashes to ashes and dust to dust from which we came. How could God reconstitute the bodies of every person, certainly in this case of the Christians, and raise them to life? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. It's a wonderful question. I'm happy to answer it for you. So turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15. Let me show it to you. Paul answers it. Actually, I don't. 1 Corinthians 15. Look with me in verse number 12. Oh, I love to hear the pages of your Bibles turning. Good job. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... By the way, let me, let me take a survey right quickly. How, how are we doing at Brookstone? Do you believe that Jesus Christ was buried and rose from the dead? If you do, shout amen. 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 All right, he says, if you say that, verse number 12, if you say that Christ rose from the dead, how is it then that some of you don't believe in the resurrection of our bodies? Do you see his point? You don't question the resurrection of our bodies Because you can't question that without questioning the resurrection of Jesus. Look at the next verse, verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, that is if we don't rise, then Christ has not risen. Verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is empty. And we've been found to be false witnesses because we've been preaching that God raised Christ up. Whom if God didn't raise him up, then the dead, that is we, when we die, we will never rise. Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. Do you see what he's doing? He's saying that the, the resurrection of Jesus, which we celebrate and affirm as the most fundamental and, and, and um, necessary reality of the Christian faith, that Christ rose from the dead, if we believe that, then that resurrection of Jesus forms the foundation and makes possible our own resurrection. And our ultimate resurrection in the final analysis will be one of the things that proves and substantiates the fact that Christ, in fact, did rise as well. He says that Christ has risen, therefore we will rise. Verse number 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But everyone in his own order or his own time, Christ first, and then afterward, they that are Christ's will be raised, when? At his coming. Are you with me? The dead in Christ will be raised when the Lord returns. Go to verse 35. But some of you will say, well, how are the dead raised up? And what will their bodies be like? Some people in in Corinth are mocking this doctrine of Christian resurrection. They said, what are you talking about? Our bodies are going to rise from the dead. Paul, have you ever seen a dead body? Do you know what happens to a dead body? Do you mean to tell me this this decaying body is going to rise? What, What will that be like is the question. Verse number 36, Paul's gentle answer. You fool. (laughs) That's a foolish question. That which you sow is not made alive except it die. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body that shall be, but you sow bare grain, whether it's wheat or some other grain, but you sow the seed, but God gives that seed a body as it pleases him. 
Now listen, listen. What Paul is saying is this, that the body that we bury, that Christian loved one dies, your mother, your father, your, your child, your loved one, your friend passes away, they know the Lord. Their spirit's with the Lord, but their body goes in the grave. We sow that body like we sow a seed. We plant it in the ground, hoping for one day it will come forth, just like we hope for a garden to come forth. And he says, in the same way that God gives a body to a tomato seed and God gives a body to a cucumber seed and God gives a body to a watermelon seed, God gives a body, an eternal body, to that seed of the human fleshly body that you've sown. When it comes out, it will come out as a body that pleases him. Look at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. At the day when Jesus returns, Christ will descend shouting commands. One of those commands, no doubt, will be like it was in John 11 to Lazarus, come forth and the bodies of every believer in the history of the church will come forth from the grave and be resurrected to live forever. Amen for that biblical hope. But not only will those bodies be raised, but the third thing that will happen is that the living saints, living Christians, will be caught up. And in fact, you're still in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul talks about this there as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4, when the trumpet blast sounds... For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we that are alive, we shall be changed. In the same way that my beloved buried one, their body must be renovated, made eternal at the resurrection, so my body must be made eternal. We shall be changed as well. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And so he talks about the fact that when Christ comes, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we who are alive will be caught up. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and let's talk about what that will be like when the church is caught away. Look at it, verse number 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which are alive and remain, listen, stop right there. There will be some people, many Christians alive all over the world. On the day when Jesus comes, maybe us. We which are alive and remain, verse 17, shall be caught up, caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. When Jesus comes, the dead will rise, the dead saints will rise, and then suddenly every Christian on the face of the planet will be called up to be with the Lord. Many of you know that the, the Greek word that's translated called up is the word harpazo. And the word means to seize suddenly. It means to snatch away. In the same way that if you had a toddler toddling toward the edge of a of this platform or something much higher than this and they were going to fall to certain injury or death as a, as a good father, a good mother, a good parent or a, or a decent human being, you would come whether you knew that child or not and you would seize them. You wouldn't stand back and go, oh, please, toddler, little boy, little girl, please stop. No, you would run and snatch them away. Here's what the Bible says. If y'all listen, shout amen. One day Jesus will come, the dead will rise, and our Lord will snatch us out of this world, seize us, and carry us in that instant to heaven. We call this the rapture of the church. The word rapture is not found in your English Bible, but it's a thoroughly biblical word. It is a Latin, it's a, it's a translation of a Latin word, and the word, the Latin word was in the Latin translation of the Bible. It means to catch away into another place. If you wonder what that might be like, I mean, how, how would that you know, appear on the earth or in, in the culture, in your house? What would it be like? 
You need only look to the book of Acts. You can read it later, Acts 8, 39. You have a wonderful example of what it looks like where Philip is baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch and the Bible says that as soon as he came up out of the water that the Spirit of, the God, the Spirit of God snatched him away, carried him away. And the word used there in Acts 8.39 is the word harpazo, same word, same exact word, snatched away. And what was it like in Acts 8.39? It says that the eunuch saw Philip no more. He disappeared. If y'all listening, say amen. amen. There was a moment when Philip was standing there and there was a moment he was gone. And God moved him to another place. When Jesus comes... We will be present in this world. By the way, hopefully serving the Lord faithfully. Amen? Ready for him to come. Always busy about his business. Our hearts focused on him. Not rebelling, not living in sin, but very focused on serving him. That's what we want. That's our desire. And when he comes, we will have whatever's happening in this world. He will seize us out. And the very next conscious thought you will have, you will be in the air with Jesus, your Lord. Amen. I don't know if you get excited about that, but I'm pretty pleased about it myself. Now, the Bible says that this happened to the Apostle Paul. He was called up into heaven, uses the same word, harpazo. He was called up into heaven. In Revelation 12 and verse 5, where the Bible speaks of the ascension of Jesus, it uses this word harpazo, that Jesus was carried up into heaven. The fact of the matter is, on the day that Jesus comes all around the world, in an instant, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a twinkling of an eye, every Christian saint will be, will be caught away. And by the time it'll happen in a, in a moment, too fast to even know what's happening, in a twinkling of an eye, by the time my feet leave the earth before I get to, to into the presence of Jesus, I will be completely transformed, incorruptible, uh, replacing corruptible, incorruption, replacing corruption, and I will be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, forever. Praise be to God. What will happen when Jesus comes? Jesus will descend, the dead will rise, and the saints, uh, the dead will be raised, and the saints will be caught away. And then number four, and I've already alluded to it, but the fourth thing that Paul says is that we will meet the Lord in the air. That's going to be an amazing, amazing moment. But if it seems all too fantastical to you, if you say, now, pastor, come on. I can believe in a, in a Savior who died and rose. But the dead rising and the saints being called away, disappearing in a moment, carried to heaven, can I really believe that? If it seems too difficult for you to believe, just imagine, just think about how many times it's happened before. I've already mentioned Paul. It happened with Paul. It happened at the ascension of Jesus. What about Enoch in the book of Genesis? Who the Bible says was just going along his way, walking with God. And he was gone. God took him to heaven. What about Elijah? Who never died, but just was carried off to heaven in chariots of fire. It has happened before, and it will happen again one day when the Lord comes. Now, some of you are asking questions, and they're good questions. They are questions that are like, but what about other verses? They're, the Bible says other things about the coming of the Lord. What about those verses that talk about Jesus coming to the earth? Pastor, you said he's coming to the clouds, and we're going up there to meet him, but doesn't he come back to the earth? He does. The Bible, in fact, tells us that he will stand, Zechariah tells us, on the Mount of Olives. The same place he ascended to heaven from, one day he'll stand on again. The Bible tells us that there's a day that's coming where there's going to be a battle on the earth. It's the battle to end all battles. It's called Armageddon. Revelation 16 describes it. Matthew 24. Jesus himself talks about a judgment where he will divide the sheep and the goats, the people, like sheep and goats. And there will be a judgment of the nations. In Matthew 24, he tells us about a period of time called the Great Tribulation. What about all those things? Well, all of those things do occur. They will happen. But they all will happen after the event that I'm talking about 
today. And we'll talk about all of those events in the coming weeks because all of those are referenced in First or Second Thessalonians. But here's what I want you to know, that this event where Jesus comes to the clouds, raises the Christian dead, and calls the church, the saints, out of this earth in the rapture, that event is imminent. It is imminent. I don't believe necessarily, well, I shouldn't say that I don't believe that the battle of Armageddon and the tribulation is imminent. It could certainly begin very soon. I don't believe the revelation of Jesus coming to the earth and sitting upon a throne is going to happen for several years. We'll talk about why. But I do believe that the rapture of the church could happen before you get in your car and make it to lunch today. It could. And you and I need to be ready. Last thing I would say to you is this. It is that this uh, promise of Christ's return is a comfort to believers. It's a comfort to believers. In fact, this is what Paul says in this passage, verse number 18. He ends by saying, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Be comforted by this truth that Jesus is coming. But do you know who's comforted? Believers. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, here's the thing. Some of you don't believe that Jesus died and rose again. You may believe it intellectually, but you haven't believed it fully and trusted in it. And if you don't believe and trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus, then the return of Jesus, at the very least, causes you to mock. At the worst, it causes you great terror and fear. But if you know Jesus, the thought of him coming is a comfort to our hearts. In fact, the Bible calls it our blessed hope that he's coming one day. So, does this thought of Jesus returning, this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, does it give you hope? I hope so. Last question you might ask is this. You might be saying, well, Pastor, what happens to me? If I don't know Jesus, I'm not a Christian. I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus. If if you're right, Pastor, if if you're reading this passage right and Paul's telling the truth, and Jesus is going to descend, and the dead are going to rise, and Christians are going to disappear and go to heaven. What about me? What happens to me in that moment? And here's the answer. It's the sad answer, but it's the truth. It is that in that moment, if Christ comes, and you're sitting here this, this morning, and you know the truth of the gospel, and Christ comes, and you're left behind, I believe you will be lost forever. That there's no hope of salvation. And we'll talk about that from Thessalonians as to why I believe that's the case, but I would suggest to you that even if it's possible for you to get saved during the tribulation, even if that's possible, and certainly many people will be saved during the tribulation, but not those who have rejected Christ before he comes. But even if I'm wrong about that, and it's possible for you to get saved during the tribulation, I don't think you would. You might say, oh, I would do it. Boy, preacher, that happens. Millions of Christians disappear. I believe it. I'll get saved then. I don't think you will. Because why would you reject him now while it is so easy and yet trust him then when it will cost you your life? If you don't know Jesus, give your heart to him today.